Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so we are here for a very special stream because a very important documentary that is very good, and I've watched it, and it's very good and full of information, is about to premiere. Uh, the link is down below. It's on Peter Coffin's YouTube channel. You can watch this very great documentary called Less Sucks, Overpopulation, Degrowth, and Eugenics. Uh, and it's very, very full of information. We have the creator of that film with us here right now, uh, comedian Peter Coffin. And we also have Fox Green, the host of Space Commune podcast. So welcome, everybody. Um, you know, we're going to have a great discussion here for the next hour and a half before the documentary premieres. And once this stream is over, you can just hop over onto Peter's channel at the link below and watch it. Um, it, it should be great. Um, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, so I guess, um, we'll start out, uh, Peter, do you want to kind of tell people what the documentary is about, why you made it, et cetera? Well, yeah. I, first off, thanks for having me on your channel. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, I am really excited for this because back in 2008, I put out a documentary on overpopulation. I had seen a lot of like antinatalism in like the quote unquote left, where a lot of people were very anti growth in, in a different way. They didn't really use those words at that time. It was more about like, it's bad to have more kids in, in a world like this. We're using up the planet's resources. That's a, that's still around, but um, so I made a documentary about it. it was uh, 52 minutes and it addressed Malthus. It addressed uh, how eugenics is kind of the way that they answer. Who do you get rid of when you reduce the population? Um, and, you know, it, 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 it hit well, like people liked it. I think it did help uh, because in bread tube, there was kind of, that narrative battling itself at that time. And I was uh, more closely affiliated to that at the time as well. And, and I was like, it's so weird that people want quote unquote socialism, but they want less people and they seem to be anti-human when socialism is ultimately at the core, a pr very pro-human pro-growth ideology or should be at least. Um, so I made that and for you know, a couple of years, it seemed like it wasn't a big like narrative, at least in those areas. And then Jason Hickel came along and released this book called Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World. And that came out, I think in 2019, I think if it was I remember 20, right. 2020. 2020. Yeah. It was one. Yeah. 2020. But when that happened, there were, a lot more people who were kind of signing on to this degrowth version of this narrative because the amount of times that Jason Hickel says it's not about overpopulation, it's about overconsumption. Um, and then after after he got people on overconsumption, it's like it's not about overconsumption, it's about overproduction. Um, but that also, I mean, it ultimately relies on this idea that. Supply is driven exclusively by demand, uh, which it is not. Uh, if you have large scale industry, that's not how it works. Um, but that's that's what they think. They think that energy demand is why uh, we produce large amounts of energy and they want to reduce it. They want to reduce our demand on energy. And ultimately, uh, if you follow the logic, why is it that the population grew to 8 billion people? It's not because it grew to 8 billion people. It's because energy production enabled it to. Like we found new ways to utilize resources and produce lots more energy. And that gives us the ability to live. So if you want to reduce energy production, uh, you want to reduce people's ability to live. Like that is, it's key. Like you can't have a society without energy production. And you can't have the society that we live in now without the current level or a higher level of energy production. And that's exactly what they want to do. And, and a lot of them will say, well, it's not about reducing the population, but what will happen if you half the world's energy uh, production? It's not like a bunch of people aren't going to die from that. That's that, that is, look what happened when they lost power for three days in Texas a couple of years ago, like 200 to 700 people died, depending on where you get your, 
your numbers. Like uh, there's a there was a lawsuit going on where they were suing the the state for reporting something like 248 when they believed it to be somewhere in like 700 area. But I mean, that wasn't a result of that was just an unplanned outage that lasted for a couple of days. Uh, what degrowth people are usually advocating for is this transition to 100% renewables, which are intermittent, which uh, unless you have batteries, which are addressed in the documentary as well, it's it's intermittent power. You get it at certain hours of the day. With solar, you get it when the sun's out. With wind, you get it when the wind is blowing. And depending on the season or the type of weather, you get extreme variances in the amount that is produced. Um, batteries, they love to act like that's the solution, but it's really not. There's not enough uh, capital in the world to, to flat out store enough energy. And, and I'm sure somebody will be like, you don't need to store enough energy for a full year. You need to store some for at least a few months because to run a city off of a battery, uh, you're going to have to understand that there are, are there's needs like uh, a popular one or, or one that Fox and um, Alex from Space Commune and myself always like to refer to are the uh, dialysis machines. If the power goes out, you can't run one of those. That's mm. that's just it just it's it's out of that. And then whoever needs it gets sick and in dies, like possibly. Well, I, I'm not saying that it's not possible. Go ahead. Batteries are not not only an inferior uh, oh, technology yeah. to things like nuclear and even fossil fuels, but they and some degrowthers will admit this, that they require the amount of um, rare earth minerals that they require is even more politically fraught uh on the the international scene as far as like acquiring all the all these minerals to not only create the solar panels but the batteries to back them up the mm -hmm. technology just isn't isn't there uh that we need in order to replace uh fossil fuels which is what they're trying they are supposedly trying to do which i yeah. ultimately i don't think it's even about replacing fossil fuels it's about lowering our con our energy consumption altogether Absolutely. I didn't, I didn't if it were about, you off there, oh, yeah. Well, well, Fox, do you want to is, introduce yourself, by the way? Um, Peter got a chance. Yeah. So do you want to go and tell us about yourself, uh, Space Commune, etc.? Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm Fox from Space Commune, and I think it's it's kismet that we're all here tonight because um, you know Peter was just talking about the overpopulation video that they made a few years back when they were more part of the bread tube crowd, and I remember that sticking out in my mind as saying like this is the first video that I've ever seen that's challenged this preconceived notion of overpopulation to me because you know growing up I I never questioned this. I think Caleb you even talked about this on a stream recently where it's like growing up you were never. I, I was never taught to question it. I was taught that overpopulation is just a thing that we need to eventually address. Um, and that was the first time somebody had said, actually, no, overpopulation is is not a problem. Um, it's it's that's a Malthusian idea that's kind of made up by the ruling class to justify all kinds of things. Um, and so my political journey has involved uh learning about my local area and this uh the son of warren buffett peter buffett who happens to be a big fan who happens to be uh, a malthusian just like his father warren buffett um and is putting a lot of money into degrowth efforts so i remember when peter actually had you caleb on um the low society podcast that was really one of the first times i had listened to you talk Caleb and you brought up degrowth and I was like wow this is the first time I've heard somebody talk about degrowth um in the political sphere so it, it's like kismet that now the three of us are together again and I think we started out earlier this year doing a stream about land back or something like that but you know it's it's great that we've sort of come full circle and now mm -hmm. here we are talking about this issue um all together uh I think it's perfect um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of my work with space commune deals with the nonprofit industrial complex, Peter Buffett. Um, and now of, of course, degrowth, because that's, that's, what's been going on. Um, and all of a sudden it's blown up right now, all of a sudden degrowth is very, very popular. I mean, it's a, a topic that 
Peter and I have been talking about, you know, in, in privately and for a few years now, I feel like, right. I, I can't yeah. even remember. We've been, we started it's been like at least that. three years. We've been talking about it. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we've done several streams on it too. And, and yes. now it's finally becoming, you know, it's getting picked up and now um, there's a few br like new bread tubers who are making very popular videos about it. And I think it's very good that we're, the three of us are attacking this. So I'm yeah, the new bread adjacent degrowth influencers yeah. are just sort of materializing suddenly. And it's very like over the last couple of months, it's really bizarre to me because it's been something that we've sort of watched happen. And as it's happened, it's almost like, I, I feel like it's starting to hit like, uh, like critical mass. I think that, I think that we're going to see a lot of people pushing degrowth in the next short period of time yeah well i mean for me you know i spent my life trying to learn about marxism uh and you know like like when i was a kid in school overpopulation was taught like just as it's if it's a fact there's no debate about it right it's just a fact in college it was taught that way and you know when i first got interested in in marxism i i didn't quite understand it right i, I you know i understood that you know we want to create some society where everyone's Whereas there's egalitarianism, people are equal, and that means, you know, eventually you want public control of the means of production. And then Marxists would distinguish between the lower stage of communism, socialism, and the higher stage of communism. And socialism is what they have in Cuba and Venezuela and China and places like that. And then communism is like this ideal. And I, I never quite understood what communism was about um, uh, until um, I remember it was explained to me that the basis of communism is the eradication of scarcity. And then it made sense to me. I always thought like higher stage of communism was like behaviorism. It's like after socialism mm -hmm. runs the government for so long, people will just learn to be nice and then we won't need a state or something like that. No, it's about eradicating scarcity. The idea is the need for the state is rooted in scarcity. The need for social hierarchies is rooted in scarcity. And then during the financial crisis of 2008, that's when I really started to get into Marxism because I was I was being taught that the crisis, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 was rooted in overproduction. And so I had to learn all about how the problem with capitalism is that, you know, never before have we had a society where people are hungry because there's too much food, where people are homeless because there are too many houses. And that under our system, the more technology advances, the more abundance that's created, the poorer everyone gets. Right. And I, and I learned about the coal miners riddle of this. You know, this little boy says to his father, why is it so cold in the house? And he says, because we can't afford any coal to heat the stove. And he says, why can't we afford any coal? He says, because I lost my job at the coal mine. He says, and why did you lose your job at the coal mine? Because there's too much coal, right? And that's Marxism. That's the Marxist critique of capitalism is that the more the worker produces and the more efficient technology becomes, the poorer people get. And this shows that we have a, a, a highly inefficient economic system and we need to get beyond it and have a society where the means of production are rationally controlled and then that will lead to so much growth that that the state can wither away and that that's what marx was talking about in capital i and think there, there's there, i think the, there's three terms that you've picked up on here the abundance the post scarcity and the overproduction which is something that degrowthers actually use these arguments mm -hmm. too yeah. but they they twist these things to say that the only way to move past those issues is to for all of us to just stop consuming so much so i think that it, it's it's important to, to talk about those issues within the context of the political program that will actually work not this idealistic utopian degrowth degrowth is going to solve for scarcity uh abundance and for overproduction Right. And that the, the, you know, that the idea of, of socialism is just as this utopian ideal, like everyone mm -hmm. should, everyone should have enough. We should share the wealth or something. That's, there's nothing new about that. That's been around for a long time, but Marxism, the fundamental ideology of Marxism and scientific socialism is about growth. It is about how mm -hmm. capitalism is holding back growth. And it, and it goes into great detail in your documentary, Peter, you talk about the tendency of the rate of profits to fall and, the problem with capitalism is not that it's creating growth. It's that it's holding back growth. You know, they've been mm -hmm. investigating. They've been investing in Africa for 200 years. And look at Africa. Right. And you know, there's big chunks mm -hmm. of Africa where they don't have electricity, big chunks of Africa where they don't have running water. The problem is not that capitalism is creating growth in Africa. It's that capitalism is holding back growth in Africa. And the same for Central America and South America and many parts of the world. If the problem was growth, uh, we, we wouldn't see huge sections of the world where the life expectancy is below 60. 
Um, mm. I mean, this is this is the problem with capitalism, and 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 this this has been lost. And to see now hear everyone say, well, the problem with capitalism is that it creates growth. They're missing the point. One one thing that kept coming up when I was watching your documentary is that these people who equate um, equate capitalism with growth, they they have failed to notice that in the period we're living in. The main way that capitalists are enriching themselves is through destruction. They call it destructive accumulation. The opioid epidemic, was that growth? Getting all these people hooked on opioids? That's not growth. That's killing people. That's destroying people's lives, turning them into addicts. The prison industrial complex, is that growth? Is, you know, taking people that would be productive workers in the economy and locking them in jail where they, you know, they, they might, you know, work for two pennies an hour or might not work at all. They might just be living, you know, a, 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 you know locked away. Is that growth? is the military industrial complex. That is not growth, right? That's destruction. If there ever was such a thing and capitalism in our time is very much uh, about accumulation through destructive apparatus, through destroying the means of production. But I know both of you, Peter and Fox have plenty you want to say on that. So please go on. Well, that's the, that's the, one of the larger aspects of what Dutt touches on in fascism and social revolution is that um, once you get to a certain point, yeah, I, I mean, if any, if anybody wants to read like imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, two, that's it. Like, read that book. Um, it, it, it more or less comes to you with this idea that the capitalists have gotten to a point where either profit is stalled, or they understand that profit's going to stall because of developments in technology and in technique. And they have to artificially limit production. And that happens first by them. Oh, I had my cat rip out my headphones. <laughs> uh, first by them <laughs> um, buying out or, or um, you know, dominating a market, like basically stamping out all competition and then themselves pulling back in production. But there's also uh, actually destruction of, the uh, means of production. They actually go ahead and 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 take it apart. They dismantle it. Um, they decommission nuclear reactors. Um, <laughs> uh, they, I mean, that obviously happens now rather than in 1934 when he was writing that, but it's an example of how it happens now. The way that it moves, uh, it, it sort of maintains itself is you either... So labor is where value comes from. So you, you have human labor going into a commodity. So you got 100 people necessary to make a commodity. You make a certain amount of money off of that commodity because that's how much labor went into it. When your machines and your techno technique are developed, it takes less people. So you let's say you bring that same job down to needing one person, but you still produce the same amount of stuff. Nobody's going to pay the same amount for that thing because it takes less people. It takes less time. It takes uh, less labor. That that's is, a good thing. yeah, that is a good thing. Like to be clear, that's uh, you know that that graph that uh, DSA types like to put up the productivity and the wages, where they show the productivity goes up and the wages stagnate or even go down. Um, that's actually good. I mean, it's not good for the worker. Like the worker obviously doesn't want to see their wages go down. But the if we had a, a public ownership of the means of production, if we were actually operating on a manner that the capitalists weren't retaining all of the commodities produced and the profit produced from them, they would be, we wouldn't want any labor to be going into something. We would want less and less and less labor going into like the, anything that can be automated. We would want to be automated. Yeah. And, and the fact that we are living in an age in which technology and technique can progress, that's fantastic. We want that. We just want to change the mode of appropriation. Now, right. ultimately, that's not what happens. So instead, the capitalists have to find ways to artificially inject labor into production which usually comes from um, destroy, destroying the means or just limiting production artificially uh, or, uh, you know, making like Starbucks into a, uh, uh, oh boy. You can't come in here. You need to go out. <laughs> I'll have to deal with that in a second, I think. But um, 
point point being uh the the labor has gone from the commodity production makes the commodity less valuable uh, but demand may not go up or it may go up slowly so profit goes down and they have to do something about that that's degrowth yeah self-driving cars right in a socialist society self-driving cars would be a good thing because it would mean there's less work that needs to be done uh, but under our capitalist mode of production, self-driving cars would lead to mass poverty. And that yeah. this this is the problem. And the problem isn't self-driving cars themselves. The problem is capitalism. And the degrowth argument is like, no, we should just reduce technology. Everyone should be poorer. They don't get it. Go ahead, Fox. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to point out that there's somebody in the, the comments who uh, is a Jason Hickel fan who is he's the top degrowther. Right. And he's saying, oh, I could quote all these Jason Hickel things at you and you would love it. Um, and I'd love to point out the fact that Jason Hickel is a, is very, very talented. He's a very talented man because he takes concepts that sound very Marxist, sound very socialist, uh, but he he'll tweak like one or two words. Right. He'll, and that's what I was saying before to Caleb is that using these words as the degrowthers will use words like post scarcity and abundance and overproduction. Right. Or even post capitalism. You know, yeah, right. They call themselves anti-capitalists, right? Like Greta Thunberg is an anti, she came out as an anti-capitalist. So, mm -hmm. but the, the key thing to, to note with these people is they're, so, and I, I here, here's the crux of it, right? Is that uh, the way degrowthers frame their, their critique of capitalism is they're critiquing a very old version. They're stuck in a very archaic uh, version of history where um, we're, we haven't hit this post-industrial uh, economy yet we haven't hit the world war post-world war ii well, world yet they're they're still stuck in this in this world where they're critiquing the industrial capitalists right because they think that the 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 capitalism is all about pushing all these workers into the factories and making widgets until the rivers are polluted with widget runoff fluid. And <laughs> um, we're, we are in a modern world. We are in a post industrial world. We're in a world where our, the, where the imperialist ruling class that runs the Western countries like the United States and Europe, Canada, um, they're not they're not looking to build more industry they're not looking for more profits they they've already s sort of won the monopoly game right at the end of the monopoly game somebody already has all the stuff right that's how the, how you win is you win monopoly cuz you acquire everything and you're you you have everything they're not looking to grow more profits they're not looking to like grow more stuff and create more things this is the the con this is the basis of what degrowthers argue against is that the capitalists are just sitting in their mansions figuring out how to make more money. They don't need to make more money. They have more money than God at this point. They have so much more money than the rest of the population that it doesn't money doesn't even matter to them to at this point. It's about maintaining control over what they have now, right? They have, they have the most control over everything in the world. And in order to, hold on to that control. They, they need to make sure that the value of things doesn't drop because when, when you produce more and the value of things drop and the rate of profit falls and everyone has more things, then by comparison, you don't have as much, right? So it's not about them sitting in their castle and saying, I need to make, how do I make more money to, they don't, right. they have more money than fucking God at this point. So that, that, I mean, that's the point I wanted to make there. It's, but it's that, really about maintenance of class lines. That's really yeah. what it's about. Exactly. Right. You know, I remember I really had a big revelation. I was sitting at, in the movie theater with my wife in downtown Brooklyn in 2017. And I was watching this movie that came out just after Trump had been elected president called Beatrice at Dinner. Have you seen this movie? I have um, not. Yeah, it's a movie starring Selma Hayek. And... The premise of this movie is that there's this wealthy, super rich California family, and they have this this person who's played by Selma Hayek, who's like it's almost an offensive caricature. She's this indigenous person who does like magic and cured their son from cancer or something. <laughs> yeah, right. And she's from South America and she's like over at dinner. And then they're having their friend come over who's like played by John Lithgow, who's this like industrial capitalist. Right. 
and uh you know and and Salma Hayek is like the the good magical indigenous person who cured this ultra richest fam family their kid of cancer and John Lithgow is this evil industrial capitalist talking about how he like invests and then he he makes this pro growth speech about he he wants to build things he's not like those wall street guys that just do speculation he wants to build things and then Salma Hayek is all like oh but my community is being destroyed by your big tractors and your big land and I'm <laughs> watching this right and and i'm watching this and i'm realizing like oh my god this is this is satanic this is evil because i've been to south <laughs> and central america do you know why people love the sandinista socialist government in nicaragua it's because they build things it's because they built hospitals they've electrified 95 percent of the country uh you know i mean in venezuela i i couldn't walk two feet without them telling me and here we built this i walked through neighborhoods where before socialism came in they didn't have any electricity they didn't have any running water and it was socialism that that, that built these communities and neighborhoods and 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 all of this and and of course you know this this magical indigenous person works for the big capitalists Right. And the target is these industrial capitalists that still believe in economic growth. And where is all the growth happening? It's happening centered around China with their Belt and Road Initiative. They're mm -hmm. the ones in socialism that's pushing growth in the world now. Yep. And so basically this this magical movement that loves the magical and business people and loves growth. This movement is the big capitalists trying to stop the wave of growth that is coming out of Latin America. And I watched this and then, you know, the end of the movie, you know, Selma Hayek's character has this fantasy about stabbing to death, the John Lithgow character. And like, she's just mm. like violently stabbing him to death or something. And, and you watch it and I watch that movie and I'm like, oh my God, like leftism at this point. Yeah, there's a reason that they only can critique, critique the pencil factory. It's all about the pencil factory, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and the, a, a, it's all about the pencil factory. That's the only critique they can have. And the second you say finance, the second you say big banks, they go, oh, you can't say that. That's anti-Semitic. You're a yeah. fan. Yeah. It's that's who they're working Happy Hanukkah, for. by the way, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Hanukkah right. to you as well. <laughs> same, same. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's who they're working for. I mean, it, it is the degrowth stuff is serving the richest of the rich to keep in line the lower levels of capital. I mean, you even see like the movie itself probably was financed by some movie studio that's owned by finance capital. Like if you look at like who owns Facebook, it's the same BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. Like they own the largest stake. Those three tend to own the largest stake in basically everything. And that has absolutely nothing to do with the Jewish faith at all in any way, shape or form. Like it doesn't require the involvement of even a single Jew in order to do that. <laughs> it's just it's it's silly, but it's exactly what they do. And, and it's such a good deflection because it's it's that's really what the problem is. Like industrial capitalist. Yeah, of course, the boss is the problem at some point. That's not not true it's just they're not the people who are in control they're mm. not the people directing global production they're not the people exploiting the resources and the children in africa they're not you know it's like people love to say like oh i this factory owner he's so bad and it's like you were talking about such small potatoes like it's just Nothing compared to imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Once again, it's and if you if you read Lenin, that like you start to see that that's it's just not about um, what Marx and Engels were primarily critiquing. I mean, it's there. That stuff is at the center of it, but it expands upon that. And it's it's important to understand that we have moved to a higher or or, or rather bigger, I guess, stage of capitalism. And did that require growth? Sure. But in order to maintain it, you have to have growth here, degrowth here, um, and, and you just sort of cycle. Imperialism rearranges things as much as it possibly can to preserve itself. And ultimately, that is what's going on when we're talking about degrowth. We're not talking about um, the pencil factory, once again. We aren't talking about producing a commodity. Like, no matter what, we're going to be producing commodities. It's just a thing that happens in capitalism. That's not the problem that is being addressed now at the global scale. Like the thing that is being addressed is who owns what, how much power X country or company or whatever has, and how do we maintain a situation where we all get something out of it In when we're talking about the imperialist bourgeoisie of any any specific country you want to mention. 
Yeah, well, there's a quote, I guess. Well, Fox, go ahead, and then I'll pull up the quote from your book that's quite popular online these days. Well, what I, I was thinking of um, the, the the new Avatar movie, right? Uh, which, is, <laughs> which is the noble, you, what you're talking about, Caleb, with that other movie is the noble savage trope, mm -hmm. which goes hand in hand with, with wokeism, right? Which is the... Mm -hmm the Silicon Valley ethos. It's the ruling class. The imperialist ethos is, is this wokeism and the noble savage. And uh, it's so funny that uh, James Cameron, the, you know, just put out some statement. He was interviewed in some, in something where he put out a statement about com he outright comparing avatar spoiler alert. Avatar is sort of based on native tribes. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a thought. Yeah. What, what a surprise I... there. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know which natives are blue though. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. They're post racial cat people, I guess. Right? Yeah. They're nine foot blue cats. <laughs> um, yeah. But people are like free, like some of the bread two people are freaking out over the, the comments because he, it sounds very racist what he's saying, but really he's just being, he's just saying the noble savage trope taking it to it's it's you know he, he's saying the quiet part loud and, and everyone's like no 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 you can't well, that, say that that's exactly that's, what it is they get mad when you say the quiet part loud even yeah, though they so, want to be able to say it quiet like yeah uh like i mean there's a small clip of it but we talked about it more in the stream that i did with you a few weeks ago that bob jensen clip where yeah. the this sort of goofy little like I forget what the channel was called, but like a sort of a fantasy of the entire world falling. It was, yeah, apart. it was like a collapse. Yeah, the collapse, collapse, a collapse something. channel or something, or that they, they're stuck the with like that, that society is just going to collapse and that we've hit the point of no return and that the end is near. And that really is what the the extreme degrowthers believe in. There's there's the people who kind of lightly dabble in it and they they mm -hmm. actually think that renewable energy is a solution. The ones who are very really have taken like the red pill or the green, whatever pill <laughs> taking the logic to its conclusion, they've taken the logic to its con final conclusion. They're the ones who, who actually will admit, actually, you know what? The renewable stuff is a joke. We can't actually do that. It's not feasible. They know it's not feasible because ultimately what it serves is an, an agenda of depopulation. And this is what a lot of people who are sort of, stick their toe in the water and, and read the Jason Heckle book and have a make it feels good. And they get tingly all over. Um, they think that, Oh no, 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 actually degrowth isn't about Malthusianism. It's not about depopulation. It's just about us reducing our consumption. Cause if we reduce our consumption, then we don't have to depopulate. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it's all about, right? Is like, well, we can depopulate or we can just reduce our consumption. But either way, we've hit our planetary boundaries and we got to <laughs> roll things back. You guys, we got to roll things back. Yeah, we got uh, class analysis says one of the most important tools of modern Malthusianisms is FDR's Agricultural Adjustment Act, lowered U.S. food costs, outcompeting world food markets, IMF Bank forcing the world uh, to buy U.S. food exports growing it themselves. What do you have to say about that? I wouldn't be able to say I'm not well informed. Let me reread about that. that. One of the most important tools of modern Malthusian is FDR's Agriculture Adjustment Act. Lower food costs out competing the world food markets and IMF World Bank forcing world to buy you. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a big part of it, right? Is not allowing. I mean, a lot of people argue that like they'll use um, Cuba. We Peter and I talked about this using Cuba as an example of how degrowth can work because they have done all these like uh, methods of growing their own food and becoming more in unison with the natural methods and whatnot. Um, I mean, the thing is we want abundance. We want what we, what we don't want. And I think localism is kind of a version of degrowth that uh, sidesteps this stuff where people think, Oh, we're just going to become self-sufficient. We're going to become an Island of one. But that's the thing is in this world, we can't have, we're never going to get to a stage of world peace and fully full development if we're if we're kept as these separate little nation states with our own sort of bubble, right? That's just it is another I mean, form of utopianism, but it's literally a recipe for scarcity too. Like it's yeah. it's it's a recipe for battling over resources because you're not connecting 
you know, supply chains or anything. Well, in this book, uh, Black Fire by Nelson Peary, it's his autobiography. Um, Nelson Peary talks about how his family, they were farmers who were African-American in Minnesota. And in the early years of the New Deal, before Roosevelt went into his like populist social democratic phase, but when he was just, you know, trying to come in and kind of stabilize capitalism, uh, mm -hmm. they talked about how one day government men showed up at their farm and executed half of their cows and then buried them. Uh, but before they buried them, they put lime all over them so no one could dig them up and eat them. And that this mm. was a measure to inflate the price of cattle because during the mm -hmm. depression, the price of cattle was going down. And so, yeah, Roosevelt, you know, there were a lot of these kind of weird degrowth measures intended to and intended to in, inflate, you know, agricultural costs. And it still goes on today. Um, I know that there's, uh, I think it's in, in Iowa or Kansas or someplace like that, uh, there is a a mountain uh, a mountain with caves in it where the government buries cheese. They buy cheese from farmers and they bury it to keep the price of dairy high, right? Mm. And that there are all kinds of mechanisms, um, especially in agriculture, that the U.S. government uses to make the costs of um, to make the costs of agriculture remain high, uh, and and you know in order to not have the agricultural sector go out of business. Um, mm. And I understand that you know there, that some of the protests uh, in order to keep the food stamps program going are like paid for by Kraft and other companies because they would lose a lot of money. Uh, you know, if food stamps went out of business, uh, if they or they got rid mm -hmm. of food stamps as a government program. So. Um, you know, that that's that's certainly something. Yeah, but all the capitalists just want to get rid of the social programs. <laughs> that's just that's the main. They hate people and they want all people to suffer. They're great. Right. right. So we got someone here who says, why do some Marxists argue that post scarcity is achievable with our current level of technology? That's simple. It, it's currently achieved. It's not achievable. It's done. Like the ruling class has abundance. They have more than we can possibly imagine. And uh, there's absolutely nothing to even change about that. If you didn't have a class that retained the product and the profit of everything, uh, whether it be commodity production or even, uh, you know, the various new forms of, of whatever you would want to call production. Um, if that all was, was available to all, we would not have scarcity. Like the scarcity we exist in, uh, is false. And it's been false for a very, very long time. Back in the 1930s, when the Great Depression was hitting, um, David Lloyd George, who was the prime minister of the U uh, of the UK at the time, uh, noted that there was something seriously wrong with the economic system because uh, abundance produced scarcity. Like that is, that's a contradiction. That's a thing that happens that is wrong. Like abundance exists. Like if you look at how much the the top 1%, let's say, has compared to uh, the bottom 75%, like it's like it's not even close. Like the bottom 75% has a fraction of what the top 1% has. When you put all of it together, like it's not abundance exists at such a high level now. It's not even it's it's not even a question how we would achieve it. It is already achieved. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of degrowthers argue that um, that w because we are already at a point where we have more than enough for everyone, that w what's really needed is a redistribution. Um, yeah, but, but that, that, I mean that solves nothing. Their theory of change is, I mean, they're anarchists. Degrowth is an anarchist ideology, so their theory of change is just that. The change starts with you and me just doing living different lives, <laughs> <laughs> which Hashtag doesn't do, do shit better. for the world stage and how Africa is being kept held back from developing their own resources. Um, you and I bike riding our bikes to the grocery store does not help people in Africa um, develop their countries because it is a world issue, right? It's a na mm -hmm. an international issue of um, a, a ruling class, which we happen to be living under, uh, which is why I think we play a very important role here in the United States and why leftists want to keep us down and want to say, burn America to the ground, fuck America, KKKans, uh, white, white America, KKKans are like the problem. No, because if we recognized how much of a role we could play in undermining that stability of that mm -hmm. ruling class that we live directly under, we could help not only ourselves, but the rest of the world develop. 
so we, we need to recognize the role that we play here um, as Americans and not shy away from it and, and step back into our uh, revolutionary past and fight imperialism from within, within our own, our, our own homes. And yeah, that's well, really, go sorry. ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, and that's really like the key right there. As long as like, if you redistributed everything that the ruling class has right now, just redistribute it and didn't modify the primary contradiction of capitalism, which is the socialization of production with the private appropriation of both product and profit. If you redistributed everything and retained that, it would eventually end up back in the ruling class's hands because that's the problem. It's not that they have everything or not that there is abundance. It's that there is a flaw in capitalism that causes the accumulation that we have seen over the last couple hundred of years. Yeah. Well, uh, Sigma marks, marks a millionaire, uh, makes a, a pretty good point here and says Cuba was forced into degrowth by U.S. imperialism. And if you really look at it, all these wars that the United States has waged around the world have been degrowth operations. Iraq was once a prosperous industrial, you know, both socialist society. And now mm -hmm. it's been degrown and its oil exports are about 10 percent of what they once were. Millions of people have been killed. Millions of people have become refugees. The country has been in chaos. Libya used to have the highest life expectancy on the African continent. Uh, it was the top oil exporting country in Africa. Now it's been cast into chaos. Half the country doesn't have electricity, instability, oil exports way down to like 9% of what they were under Gaddafi. All these wars that the U.S. Wage, wages, they result in degrowth in countries that broke free from Western capitalism, had industrialized and raised their people up out of poverty, getting cast into chaos and destroyed and you know cuba forced into degrowth yes they have they have basically tried their hardest to prevent cuba from getting the petroleum and oil they need to prevent cuba from from getting high technology and so they've been forced to to work with what they've got but they don't want that they want foreign investment uh they mm -hmm. want they want to have a stronger economy um and that a, a lot of times people just don't get this this myth that imperialism brings development to the colonized world this is really this is what they always say that they're doing right oh well, we're going to africa and we're raising people out of poverty no they're not china's doing that russia's doing yep. that but they are doing we're just the doing the white man's burden yeah yeah <laughs> it, when they attack a country uh they tend to destroy the domestic economy and forced and force uh, force the uh, the domestic economy uh, to be submissive to Western capitalism. They keep the country in poverty as a client state. So Chris Morlock just jumped in with a very big super chat. He said, Marx only mentioned the term overconsumption once in theories of surplus value. And he said it applied to elites in a slave mm -hmm. mode of production, becoming wildly wasteful, probably referring to Rome. It's being used to confuse people about overproduction. Oh, go ahead. And Morlock's referring to the the Saito argument that he is he is very much more well versed in in those that stuff than I am. Um, I will not pretend that I have an expertise. He's been slowly making his way through Marx's um, un, unpublished notes that Saito based his his thing on. He's also the person who screen captured the quote that we were going to put on the screen. Yeah. Um, For people who who don't know. Uh, Kai Saito, that's his name, right? He's, I think a, it's, yeah. he's a Japanese Marxist uh, who is very popular. His work is becoming super popular now mm -hmm. uh, because he's pushing this idea of a supposed degrowth communism. Um, and so he, just like BreadTube, he's getting promoted by the, the ruling class as like pushing the actual line of of communism or Marxism, which is extremely compatible with what the ruling class wants. It's always, it's always funny how if you take something out of context or change a word or do all that, all of a sudden Marx seems to really love all these finance capitalists. It's so and, strange. And all of his work is based on Marx's unpublished notebooks from the end of his life or something. And mm -hmm. he, it all revolves around this idea of metabolic rift. And it, it seems mm -hmm. like these guys, I mean, I, I haven't, dug too deep into it because it's obviously bullshit. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the, the truth of the matter is I don't care what Mark said at the end of his life in some random unpublished notebooks, mm -hmm. uh, because if he, it was talking about degrowth, then he's fucking wrong. I don't care. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, <laughs> that's exactly it. Like if that's genuinely what Marx is saying, that's Marx being incorrect. 
<laughs> I don't think it is though. I have I a don't feeling either. it's them yeah. taking stuff out of context, but like, I don't care if Marx was wrong about something. Marx can be wrong about something. Like he was a human being. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and the, the historically, I know there was a debate between social democrats and communists about whether the problem was underconsumption or overproduction. But it was mm -hmm. underconsumption, right? It's is the problem that that the workers can't afford to buy the products, so they don't consume enough, and that crashes the economy. Or is it the capitalists are driven to produce more than is needed, and they can't make a profit? And that just, that was a divide. And that Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, said the problem was underconsumption. But overconsumption, that doesn't fit into the Marxist understanding of capitalism at all, right? No. I mean, it just doesn't work. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's not ever the issue, right? Well, that's never the issue. With, we're concerned with production, not with consumption. We're concerned yeah. with the, me, the means of production, not the means of consumption. The consumption yeah. end is the, it's the consumer end. It's, it's what, it's the way that the capitalists think of their, their, the consumers, right? There's too many consumers. It's very close to their useless eaters right there's yeah there's too much consumption is gets very close to the malthusian ideology which we should be exactly in opposition to mm -hmm. yeah so james buchanan asks where does russia fit into this are they fighting the degrowth or doing their own also you all look nice well they're definitely fighting it i mean russia has rebuilt their agricultural sector in the last few years they they're having the biggest harvests in history uh the, you know the, the usa uh cut off russia uh from from agricultural exports and all of that in 2014 with huge sanctions and so putin has been enabling uh russians to start their own farms they subsidize the building of farms and russia's agricultural output is expanding and so now part of this Ukraine crisis has been them trying to prevent Russia from exporting grain, exporting mm -hmm. uh, fertilizer, which Russia is a major producer of, uh, in order to shut down uh, all the agricultural uh, you know, products in the world and all the agricultural entities in the world that have partnered with Russia to start growing their own food. Um, you know, and that agriculture is a big part of that. Agri agribusiness is a big part of U.S. imperialism. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, Mexico was growing their own food for thousands of years until NAFTA showed up. And now Mexico has to import its food from the United States. And mm -hmm. same for Haiti. Ha Haitians have been growing their own food for for you know centuries. And then NAFTA showed up and now the Haitians have to import all their food from the United States and they're starving. Um, so, yeah, degrowth and and preventing countries from developing their own agriculture is a big part of it. Look what BlackRock did uh, where they forced Sri Lanka to go organic. Uh, and the results. Sri Lanka is big. Yeah, you want to go and ahead. There's and actual there's there's yeah. real degrowth influencers who are tied directly to what happened in Sri Lanka too. So that look up Vandana Shiva, who was credited in Jason Hickel's book. Um, she's close close works closely with uh, the degrowth movement. Um, very much connected to that, and she was one of the major influencers who advised the uh, government of of Sri Lanka to. Mm -hmm put do this um organic movement which collapsed their their agriculture and their economy um and she's completely responsible for it and nobody is talking about it especially in the western world nobody's talking about it and i'd also say about russia uh they are very anti-degrowth they're helping the rest of the world develop their nuclear energy capacity yeah russia and china are helping other countries around the world develop their nuclear energy capacity and that is a major factor in combating degrowth is nuclear energy these guys hate nuclear energy because it's so cheap and abundant and clean and safe it's really a, an amazing uh source of energy that would create a, a higher standard of, a standard of living for millions and billions of people and it's it stands in direct opposition to what they're trying to do which is use less energy it would allow us to use tons and tons of energy um so and that's the growth or state nuclear that's really and it's that's in my opinion probably the most telling aspect of what they're doing like if they really just wanted to quote unquote save the world with quote unquote clean energy nuclear is the obvious choice it's not right. even like it, it 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 is compatible with our grid the way it is now it would supply energy in a baseload fashion uh, that people need to consistently have energy. And like, there's nothing besides building nuclear plants that needs to be done. They take up significantly less room than 
than solar, than wind. Uh, like it there was, was a once graph- called it was once called the energy that was too cheap to meter. It was so cheap and abundant that it was t- that it was too called too cheap to meter. Now look at our well, electricity bills now. You know. That mm. sounds a lot like a, a falling rate of profit issue, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Technology right. develops and they can't make as much money. So they have to degrow industry and keep them and keep us on lower forms of energy production. That's exactly what Dutt lays out, except for modernized for this energy problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that, that, when capitalism enters a long-term crisis of overproduction, the capitalists try to invent all kinds of mechanisms for artificially degrowing to try and keep the economy churning along. When ultimately what we need is a rationally planned economy so that growth is no longer held back by the irrationality of the market, right? There shouldn't be poverty mm-hmm. because of abundance. And it's capitalism that creates that. And abundance isn't the issue, right? And that's, that's the, it's not, growth is not the issue. Overconsumption is not a, a Marxist thing at all. Right. The problem is that under capitalism, abundance creates poverty and we need a society where abundance is shared by all and wealth, wealth, you know, expands, uh, you know, for everybody. I mean, that's that's the idea. And uh, this idea that people in the developing world are against industrialization. I mean, that's the noble savages, the Voltaire thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I will say this, right, that, you know, at the time that Marx was coming along, you know, you had a new layer of wealthy people from capitalism You had capitalists. Basically, Mm -hmm. you had a capitalist class that it emerged. And, you know, Marx was somebody who understood the objective laws of history and was talking about socialism as an alternative to capitalism, as a way to get rid of poverty, et cetera. But he was competing with a lot of other people that talked about socialism also. Proudhon, uh, Ferdinand LaSalle, uh, you know, um, there were many of these people, right? Uh, mm-hmm. um, I believe, you know, uh, Blanqui and others. And that, that a lot of other entities were also, you know, a lot of these people that Marx was competing with they were not really people that wanted to build some kind of workers movement. They just kind of wanted to entertain the rich people, right? They would, they would go to a group of rich people and they'd say, yeah, you're concerned about poverty. So am I, well, here's my, my beautiful utopian scheme of how I would build this ideal society. Now give me some money so I can start a, a nonprofit or an organization to promote this. And that was a lot of, you had a lot of these like flim flam men who went around to rich people, you know, and said, you know, give money to my utopian scheme for building a perfect world. And Marx is coming along. Yeah. And, and Marx is coming along and saying, well, actually, no, it'll be a struggle of the working class. We need to build a working class movement to rise up and seize the means of production. But what's interesting is not only did you have these various utopian socialist flim flam men going around during those times, you also had uh, the occult, Aleister Crowley, uh, you know, and, and a lot of these kind of people were going around. And they were saying, oh, you know, you know, we're going to we're going to help you find some spiritual path to find out who you truly are. And we're going to do magical rituals. And we know the ancient ways, the, the ancient pagan ways of worshiping these pre-Christian gods of Europe. And and that there was a lot of those folks walking around. Freudian psychoanalysis comes along. Right. And Freudian psychoanalysis is all about how sex is underlying everything. And you can come to understand your hidden desires and that it seems like synthetic leftism is is you know it's holding on to the utopians that marx was competing with and it's also holding on to other aspects of this salon culture of this flim flam men entertaining the new rich people right yeah. um and they they want to go back to the primitive ancient ways right that's the the noble savage thing and they also they have this libidinal desire there's going to be some big explosion right there's going to be this big orgasm and then everything will be back in balance and everything will be perfect, right? There'll be this big explosive Armageddon that'll correct everything. Yeah, the collapse. Right. And so, you know, it's it's something that rich rich people that consider themselves to be worldly and cultured and socially conscious love to hear about. They yeah. love to hear about the primitive, beautiful people and how great they are without the corruption <laughs> of Western man. They love to hear about the big orgasm, the big explosion that's coming when everything will be back into balance. They love hearing about the, the, the ideal model of the perfect world that they're going to help you build or whatever. But they don't like what Marx was saying, which is, <laughs> no, we actually have to build a mass movement. And they also don't like what the people in the developing world actually want, which is jobs and schools and education and healthcare and development and access to modern medicine and electrification. They don't Very like authoritarian of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, <laughs> and, and they, they, in a lot of ways, this synthetic leftism is very much it is very much fulfilling like the fantasies of rich people. And, and it is it is leftism mm-hmm. that is about 
you know, getting rich people to give you a lot of money uh, to set up your nonprofit, to tell them what they want to hear and not doing the actual hard work of building a mass movement, building an organization mm -hmm. to put forward and advance the interests of the working class to actually change the world. Um, and you can see that and synthetic leftism, counterculture, all of that, I think is a there's a class divide there. Working people want mm -hmm. their lives to get better and want certain things. And rich people who want to be entertained and feel cultured want something else. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the Congress for Cultural Freedom and that Hannah Arendt school of thought, which mm -hmm. is uh, looking at re regular people as the enemy, right? As populism is the enemy. Um, that's where fascism comes from is like <laughs> people, you know, just yeah, regular people rising up and saying that they want things. That's very fascistic of them. <laughs> and I mean, God, I'm surrounded by these people. I don't know if you know this, but Hannah Arendt is actually buried at Bard College, which is, uh, you know, right next to where I live is uh, heavily funded by George Soros. Um, and it's a, it's a woke factory, right? Mm -hmm. It's all these kids coming out of this school and doing and studying, you know, um, the inner city people and, and how we can give everyone a bike and defund the police and, um, but you know, bike to the farmer's market and then everything will be, will be good again. But it, it is very like an, an anti-populist, um, worshiping you know say, saying what you have to say in order to get the funding right mm -hmm. um i i live in the land of the the woke billionaires here i mean peter buffett run running his his uh degrowth experiment right here in my my home city of kingston new york in the hudson valley um which also happens to be a hotbed of um environmentalism right environmentalism has deep deep roots here um, and it always seems to come in conjunction with very old money that wants to sort of just keep the estate right and protect the land and preserve the land. And so this, the ideology of like land back and preserving the land and letting, you know, the, the, the noble savage sort of stuff come through. And, um, you can see how all of this goes hand in hand, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the leftism, the woke ideology and, and anti-populism, right? Anti-populism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris Morlock says any pathology of Marxism is enfranchised, a brilliant strategy. You can twist Marxism into some form of class maintenance. You get the nod. And I think absolutely. He that is the nail on the head. Exactly. And now, I, I and almost now think... we have. Well, we, now we have like right wingers who 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 hate it, who hate leftism and they call it Marxism and they hate communism. And I like want to say, yeah, you're right. I mean, <laughs> I call myself a communist, but I don't say it out loud anymore because the people who call themselves communists are all, mm -hmm. they're more anti-communist than communists. You know, it's the, like, that's exactly it. It's a mind fuck. hundred percent. The, the, yeah. the communism is the, the, you know, the, the NGO communism. It's not a real mm -hmm. communism. It's not a, it's just a, an aesthetic, a, a, a type of thing to consume. It goes back into the whole custom reality. My, one of my, previous books it's really just a fandom more or less it's just it's it's a they get the people who don't know anything to buy into an aesthetic of counterculture and rebellion and they tell them this is what marx said and this is this is how you can be like marx and this is this is how like get a get a big old beard it's gonna be real cool <laughs> um and it's like that's not what any of this is about that's actually really stupid um yeah wait you know it it's oh go ahead peter go ahead go ahead Oh, I was going to say it might it might be a good time to address that overconsumption quote, just because oh, we okay. we brought the the overconsumption pretty deep, a lot over the last mm -hmm. few segments, and and ultimately, it might be uh, a question on people's minds because we haven't really talked about overpopulation, so to speak. We've just sort of mm -hmm. alluded that it it's connected, and I think okay. th there is. Th oh boy. What, what's up? <laughs> Hi. Oh, distraction here. Okay. Yeah. Hold on just a sec here. <laughs> um, Gemma, or maybe can you go in the other room for just a minute? And Harrison, you need to leave and you need to not do anything. You guys can't be fighting like I'm doing something. That is... I mean, we should just have less kids, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They're such a bother. <laughs> no, but okay. So 
this is this is the the connection between. I'm obviously kidding. I love my kids, and and I yeah. I think we should have more kids actually. Um, <laughs> but this is the real thrust of the whole thing. They talk about you know it's not about overpopulation. We're not saying we need to reduce the population. It's about overconsumption, which ultimately is why we're producing so much energy. So overconsumption. I looked up the definition. It's when the usage of resources exceeds the sustainable pace and capacity of the ecosystem. Now, that sounds uh, reasonable, right? Where I carry capacity, we got to stop this stuff. But if you think about it, overpopulation, which is somehow uh, supposedly totally unrelated, a completely different thing, um, we absolutely uh, we, we should have nothing to do with overpopulation. Um, overpopulation is when the usage of resources exceeds the sustain sustainable pace and capacity of the ecosystem because there are too many people. It's the same thing. It's just them saying the quiet part loud. Like, <laughs> who is doing the consuming? In the documentary, I say, is it lions? Like, yes, they do eat a lot, but it's not. Like, the thing that they want to consume less is the humans. They want the humans to consume less. So if we're consuming less... Then what has brought us to the to the point where we are today? What's going to happen? We're going to regress. It's that simple. Well, the thing about both these statements is that the underlying theme here that both of these, um, the axiom you could say that both of these mm -hmm. fall back to, is that there are natural limits mm -hmm. in, in nature that that human beings are part of nature we're we're no different than animals we're just like a species of animals that has reached its natural limit and used up the the resources and that mother gaia it's gaia worship really but that yeah. mother gaia uh is is angry with us and that we we've gone too far beyond what mother gaia wants for us and what what the abrahamic religions like christianity what marxism believes uh, what communists believe is that uh, human beings are above nature and that um, we are different than any other species. We are not an animal. We're not like any other animal on the planet. We're not like just a part of nature. We have the ability to change nature to suit our needs. And that's a good thing. And that's yeah. not something that we should stop doing to please Mother Gaia. We should we should say we're human. This is what makes us human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. And that we should. That's what Ingalls said. Conquer the earth and 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 make it mar more harmonious for for our purposes, which happens to coincide with other species as well. A lot of people like to pose it as, well, we're we're harming all these other species. But no, actually, animals love us. We love animals. Uh, we we can coexist with nature. We can live in harmony and be human beings as well. Yeah, we could we could uh, you know produce things like we already do. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it. It's absolutely true, and that you know one thing I was I was talking with a friend of mine today. You know, I was thinking about this guy named Todd Gitlin, uh, who was just this awful awful social democrat pro imperialist he was part of the the anti vietnam war stuff at the very beginning but he became this like writer on the history of the 60s and his narrative was always that the anti vietnam war movement got too radical and he ended up supporting the iraq war even though he was a member of dsa when it happened and you know i was thinking <laughs> about todd gitlin and i was reading some of the quotes from todd gitlin and he was saying things that actually now I would kind of agree with like, you know, mm. that this, the 60s counterculture movement made itself inaccessible to middle America. You know, we gave up any any access to patriotism and all of that. And it makes me think back how for a long time it was the CPUSA people, the DSA people. They were the ones always telling radicals and leftists to kind of tone it down. And maybe you should wave an American flag and maybe you shouldn't do things that are off putting to middle America. But mm. now it's flipped. And now all of these people that used to be just the shills who were just basically telling every every movement protesting the Iraq war, can you tone it down some? Maybe we can say we support the sanctions, but not the war. You know, those kind of people, right? They were always just saying tone it down. They've all gotten the memo. Now, no, you need to amp it up. You need to amp it up, but you need to do everything you can to make sure this doesn't, this is not aimed at middle America. You're, they have all gotten the assignment. These people whose job 
generally in the left was to just pour pour cold water on everything. Now their assignment is to build up this deranged counter gang to push mm. forward the agenda of of the richest of the rich. And so all of a sudden now they're calling, you know, they call us Nazis for waving the American flag. These are the very same forces, DSA and CPUSA, that were always telling the anti-war movement to tone it down and wave an American flag and maybe don't protest, you know, too much or maybe maybe say you used to want sanctions, not war. You know, they were always the ones that were were saying to tone it down and try to, you know, in the name of appealing to middle America, tone it down. Hmm. Now they're saying the opposite. Now they're saying, well, we, we have to wage this culture war and you need to immediately cancel anyone who doesn't support the culture war because now they have a different assignment. Their job is to not just pour cold water on everything. Their job is to build a violent, deranged army of freaks in order to push degrowth on the population and beat back Donald Trump. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see that. Right. And I was in the workers world party and we were always the ones that were saying, we don't want American flags. We're saying, let's talk about trans people. Let's, you know, offer support to the Iraqi government against the U S imperialists. We were always the radicals in comparison to them. And they've usurped a lot of the issues that we would always bring up like trans issues and, and mm -hmm. anti-imperialism, but they've used it because they're now trying to build this counter gang. And the, the, the thing is there was no danger of reaching middle America in the nineties. There was no danger of that. You know, middle America mm. was never going to become Marxist. Now middle America could become genuine Marxists If there was actually a revolutionary appeal made a populist appeal would work now. Um, and now they're against it. And instead they're trying to build this, uh, this, this army of people, you know, this army of, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, you know, you know, nose rings and, you know, purple hair uh, <laughs> to, to beat back and, and violently attack Trump supporters and any form of opposition uh, that, that could then be used to stop the degrowth agenda of the ultra rich. It's very interesting to see the flip, right? Um, it's, it's fascinating to me. I was reading about that. So what do you think? I'm about excited. That? I'm excited for the next flip when they go to degrowth Trump. And he's, mm. he's like, <laughs> you have no idea how close to the carrying capacity we have gotten. It is so, so crazy. We have to bring down the population. Rob Jensen says we've got to bring it down to one to two billion. We need to bring it down to 100 million at the tops. <laughs> Well, like, and, you know, the wild thing is I was looking at, at, if you look at material from actual Nazis, they believe in degrowth, like actual, oh, yeah. like, oh, not, yes, not, not conservatives, right? Not Trump or not, people, yeah. like Hitler. actual Nazis. They believe Read in Mein degrowth. Kampf. Yes. Mein Kampf. It's in Mein Kampf. Overpopulation is in Mein Kampf. And they start yeah. talking about how, uh, it, how it's necessary to restrict industry. It's, it's that simple. Like it's right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, these, these culture war issues, you can't, I mean, you, it's so hard, right? And I, I think about that too, how like these, these issues of like, you know, people's rights, right? Used to be sort of a left wing, you know, but now they've blown up and they've become like a cudgel to use against, against people. And we should be against anti-wokeness. And of course, there's going to be, there's, got, you're already starting to see how popular anti-wokeness is getting. You know, mm -hmm. you see the rise of people like Elon Musk and sort of a more right, right wing, um, cultural thing that's blossoming out of in reaction to the hard, hard left. Now we're going, we're swinging back the other way to mm -hmm. hard right or whatever you want to call it. Now we're going, we were PC. Now we're going un PC. And this always, this thing always swings back and forth and back and forth. Right. But I think what we have to do is not just ignore culture, right? We need to use it when we mm -hmm. can and, and agree when things are taking the correct line, but always, be consistent over the years because I think there are people who who get that whiplash and they get tired and they're like, everyone's a fucking liar, you know. Every, they're <laughs> just saying this when it's convenient, when it's popular. But if you can be consistent over a long period of time, people start to see like, okay. And this is why I don't think we should just say, oh, well, being anti woke is a Republican thing, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, fine. If it's a Republican thing and there's some Republicans who I I can agree with, then great. You know, come on board. Let's let's keep fighting for the truth. Let's get closer to that truth. And mm -hmm. then once you see all those people who are saying these things cynically, which is what we see on the left, too, is everyone saying this shit cynically. They don't actually fucking mean it. They don't actually give a shit about anybody except themselves. They don't give a shit about race or or trans people or all they care about is promoting their own their own feelings their own agendas their own self-esteem 
uh, it's it's moral masturbation for these people. So once once it becomes apparent or being cynical, whether they're woke or anti-woke, whether they're trans or anti-trans, whatever fucking side they land on, it doesn't matter because what really matters is the consistency and actually observing the truth. And people will eventually, they'll say, I want, I want the truth. I don't give a shit about any of this stuff anymore. It's fucking tiring. They'll get sick of it. We want a real culture. We want a truthful culture. We want it's this done. People are sick of it. People are sick of the ba- the left, right, back, forth, up, down. Yeah. It's it's uh it's it's whiplash. What we stand for is something different. We're not trailing after the left. We're not tailing after the right. We have our principles that we mm-hmm. stand for, our movement, which is distinct. And it could align with one force today and align with another force tomorrow, but it's about our unique, distinct ideology. And that is one thing that I am adamant about, right? I am not interested in tailing after. And this memo that's been sent out, the Democrats are always better, right? That's not always true, right? Maybe during the Cold War, they were the faction that wanted to negotiate more with the Soviets. But, but, you know, that's not, that that shouldn't be the permanent tactical orientation. Um, And, you know, there may come a time where anti-wokeness is the main danger. I think wokeness right now is the main danger. That could easily change. You know, DeSantis is not a good guy. Um, and a lot of the people that are putting out anti-woke messages now are not good. Um, you know, I'm forced to think of, um, there's, there's one of the versions, there's many Hollywood movies based on I am legend, uh, the, the novel about the vampires, you yes. know, um, but one of them was made in like the early seventies starring Charlton Heston. It's called the Omega man. Have you ever yes. seen it? Yes. And I have seen it. Yeah. And in that version, the vampires, they're not like zombies. They're, they can only come out at night. But they're like a religious group that worships a, like a prophet named Matthias, and they don't mm-hmm. believe in technology and science. <laughs> and they're trying to prevent, after the nuclear war, civilization from reemerging because anyone who, who builds anything, they like go and attack it, right? Mm-hmm. And they're clearly supposed to be the new left, right? And Charlton <laughs> Heston is supposed to be like middle America, like average middle American who doesn't like the new left. But his critique of the new left is not that they're socialists and communists. His critique of the new left is that they're against historical progress. And that's the point of that that version of I Am Legend, if you watch it. It's a it's a pretty well-made film, um, and it's pretty right-wing. It's like a pro-Nixon film, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I would even argue that, that you know, the, the way it ends, I won't give away the ending, is kind of racist. It's kind of a racist message, the right. way it ends. But... But it's a retelling of the I Am Legend story that shows it's like the lower level military industrial complex capitalists that were aligned with Nixon and how they perceived the new left as being against historical progress. It's, mm. it's kind of interesting to look at it in that context. Well, Which, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, right? And then this idea of cultural Marxism that came out of that, which uh-huh. has almost a kernel of truth to it, right? Because it did what it was a cultural initiative to push a type of Marxism. And right. so there is like a kernel of and that was a very sort of right wing conspiracy theory, which it, itself is not true and itself is very bigoted and racist and not good. But that doesn't mean that we should give up trying to talk about the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a real thing. Well, it's just like the anti-Semitism thing. Like finance capital is the problem. It's not Jews. But every single time you bring up George Soros, the thing that they talk about is that he's Jewish. And the pro, like they are the ones that are actually, you know, doing the anti-Semitism here because you bring up a finance capitalist because they're a finance capitalist and they're like, but he's a Jew. And it's well, like they're, they're a reflection of each other. The left yes. and the right, they're a reflection of each other. They're mm-hmm. they're both arguing the same thing. They just see themselves in the mirror and they get spooked. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> you no, know, and this is a game that I've seen be played for a long time. You know, when stuff started in Ukraine in 2014, you know, uh, there were a number of like Marxists on the internet who mm-hmm. showed that like the Greek fascist party, Golden Dawn. They were taking a pro-Russian position who showed like David Duke's website. They took a pro-Russian position. So mm-hmm. based on that, we all had to oppose. And it's like, wait, no, 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 it doesn't work that like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> that just because, yeah, people that are right wing that are so far to the right, that they're so at odds with the liberal order, they take, you know, positions on international issues that are similar to what anti-imperialists take. That's not an argument for that. I mean, David Duke is obviously very anti-Israel. Should we all support Israel? Oh, David Duke's against it. You know, don't want to be with it. I mean, it's just like it's 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 a bizarre way of arguing where if somebody on the right says something that sounds kind of like something we say, even though it's a completely different thing for completely different reasons. 
Um, great example is North Korea. You know, North Korea's record of solidarity with the black liberation struggle is massive. You know, they 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 supported mm-hmm. the Black Panthers, they funded the Black Panthers, they they have stood with Palestine, they they have provided support. There's a lot of black Africans who live in North Korea, a lot of Arabs and stuff. But there's this book that the the far you know that the American establishment has promoted called The Cleanest Race. And it tries to argue that somehow they're Korean supremacists. They believe North Koreans and so there's Nazis who like North Korea mm-hmm. on the basis of that. They're like, oh look, North Korea is racially pure or something. Well, it's not. North Korea is, I mean, they stand in solidarity with all oppressed people around the world. They don't think Koreans are the master race or anything like that. They they support Koreans who have been an oppressed people occupied by Japan and then attacked by the United States. But they're not pushing any notion of the master race. But because that notion has been put out there in the American establishment, you'll get people in the far right, like hardcore neo-Nazis who are like, I love North Korea because they're racist or something. And it's like, does that mean that we should then not stand with North Korea against U.S. imperialism because there's somebody who who doesn't understand what's going on there and has, has been confused about that. Like this is, this is the kind of like confusion uh, that we see around issues like this all the time where, yeah, a lot of times people that are at odds with the liberal order because they're at odds with the liberal order, will start to, you know, take good positions. They oppose tech censorship or whatever. Um, But, you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take these positions just because they do for very different reasons. Well, there's there's a very good example of that is how the left is treating Elon Musk. Yeah. Uh, Elon Musk uh, both has has said things like tech censorship is bad. Uh, arguably, you could say that he doesn't actually believe it because he's been doing some things that contradict that. Yeah. But the fact that he's saying it, it's true. Like that is absolutely a true thing. Like we should be taking advantage of the fact that this huge, huge name is saying the same thing that we should be saying. Uh, we don't necessarily have to agree with him or not uh, criticize him. Uh, like I said, like he's doing some things that contradict that very yeah. obviously so. Sure. Um, but like another example of what Elon Musk has been saying, he has been talking about how it is wrong to dox people in real time because there's that Elon Musk jet account and he banned that account. Uh, I saw somebody saying like, well, if anybody knew my location in real time, they would come up and give me a high five. Like a leftist said that. And it's like, that is absolutely the stupidest possible thing. Like, yes, I don't really give a shit about Elon Musk's uh, personal safety. That's a hundred percent not my priority, but just saying the opposite of what he says, because he's Elon Musk and you don't like him. Um, you should not say anything, even like jokingly, I think that honestly supports the idea of doxing people's location in real time. That is insane. The fact that you're putting that forward and getting like 600 retweets and several thousand likes. That's insane. Well, right. And it's like, I mean, this notion that like, if someone's politically wrong, you can debank them, right? And they're yes. bank, they can't bank anymore. How do you think that's a good thing for the capitalists to be able to debank? <laughs> exactly. Them? Right. I mean, like, do we? Th- yeah, yeah. They Go can, on. If, if it's justified in order to take somebody's bank account over this view that's been deemed wrong by the ruling order right now, in a short period of time, that view can be like the uh, some other view that you may be more co- closely associated with may be deemed wrong by the ruling order and you are debanks like it this is stuff that you absolutely should not support at any point it's yeah. it's, it's 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 wrong to support like the debanking of some random individual that's insane yeah absolutely yeah, the, yeah i it 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 reveals what side they're on right it reveals exactly. that they're, they're just taking us one of the sides of the, whichever ruling class kind of appeals to them more, right? It's, it's, these are fights within the ruling class that then play themselves out on the people who sort of subscribe to whichever side of the ruling class they find to be more appealing. Right. And it's their, it's their, their wars, right? It's not our, we should be united as a people. We shouldn't let their divisions uh, drip down to us, the people, we should be united together. Yeah. Um, but it's another fandom really good example, the factions of capital. It's just it's fandom. Tuck- yeah. Another really good example is Tucker Carlson, who just did a, uh, a piece about revealing uh, a source who says that the JFK murders were done by the CIA, which is, which is huge. I mean, that's like 
a huge thing to be putting out there. And, and Tucker Carlson is somebody who I find constantly hitting the nail on the head on so many issues. But at the end of the day, he is extremely anti-communist, extremely anti-China. But, you know, we got to just leverage what truth is there and find the people. And this is like sort of the MAGA communism thing, right? It's, it's not about Trump. It's about the people who saw Trump speaking this larger truth and want wanted a leader who was speaking on behalf of the of the people against his own class right mm -hmm. going out against his own ruling class compatriots and saying no i'm going to speak on behalf of the working people and yeah he turned out to be kind of a phony um not not a not not the guy that we were looking for, but the fact that people are looking for that type of person is the potential that we are. That's the potential that we need in our, our movements. And we need to, we need to leverage that and seize that. Yeah, I would agree. Chris Morlock says Hitler specifically used overpopulation as a justification for foreign conquest. The mm -hmm. next stage of degrowth will be the same attack. The productivist nations headed by China. This is a war polemic. Absolutely. Morlock is always spot on with that shit, but mm -hmm. that's it. It's in Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf actually has the overpopulation argument in it. It's talking about the lack of space that Germany has, and it is 100 percent exactly what he uses to say we need to conquer uh, um, nearby and then far by uh, lands in order to shore up our production for our our place. Like the, it was actually ultimately an, an argument for um, expanding production, but the way that Hitler expanded production is obviously not a way that we want to echo. Mm -hmm. Well, and well, and, and in a lot of ways they didn't, I mean, there was, you know, the, uh, you know, the, yeah, the ultimately the yeah. labor class, you know, that was a big thing. And that, you know, I mean, I, I quote um, in, in a work, a piece I'm working on now, I quote people talking about how Nazi, the Nazi economic boom of the first couple, couple years of the exactly right was based on degrowth. It was based on reducing a huge section of the population to slave laborers. And then on top of that, restarting military production, et, et cetera. It was very much a degrowth boom. And that's exactly. why it was temporary. It was only temporary. And then by 1939, their economy was going to collapse again if they didn't go to war. So, you know. That was and we that all was, know how that turned out. They also liked renewable energy, like windmills. They were big on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, well, um, you know, I'm I'm excited for this this premiere. I mean, it's coming up. It's going to premiere in less than less than nine minutes there. Um, yeah. Coming up. I'm, I'll drop the link uh, to where it's going to premiere. I've watched it already and it's great from beginning to end. So many so many great points are made. I want to encourage everyone to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the notifications bell. Um, I am probably going to be on uh, later tonight, like late tonight, but I'm, I'm nice. dropping the link in the chat uh, right now for, for the, the premiere that's about to start. Be sure to watch this documentary because this is we need people to understand this because there's so much interest in, uh, in Marxism now, and yet we're, people are getting this dangerous distortion of it that serves the ultimate rich. Uh, now we have one from Olympia. She asked, how should we fight degrowth locally i'd like to say beat up beat up a hippie i'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> say that. all right go eat on. a hamburger <laughs> <laughs> right don't drive your car to the grocery store <laughs> yeah, right, right. don't ride your bike no i think the biggest thing that you can do is talk to people around you about how russia and china are not our enemies Absolutely. right because that's Bingo. what all this com th this connects back to degrowth is an agenda to attack uh russia and china and ultimately stopping the world from transitioning away from the capitalist mode of production mm -hmm. um and so our uh, the biggest thing we can do in the united states is say russia and china are not our enemy right we want yep. we want yes. the us to join russia and china in developing the world you know, join the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, create railroads, create jobs, create more connection, uh, peace through development, right? Peace through development. Absolutely. That's exactly it, too. Um, Morlock alluded to that in that last super chat, too. Uh, it's just it's a war uh, polemic. That's that's what this is. It's 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 I mean, it was back in 1934. When our our palm dot was writing fascism social revolution, and it is right now. It's just we've got different words. We've got the word degrowth. And we've got people who are claiming that it's not about X, Y, and Z. It's about um, A, B, and C. Uh, but A, B, and C turn out to also be letters. So it's it's you know it's not it's 
we see through this kind of stuff. And a Marxist who is concerned with moving to a higher stage of production, or even just somebody who knows nothing about Marx and wants to see us develop further and grow into an abundant lifestyle, that is what we need to be caring about. It is about debunking this kind of crap. It is about saying like these other countries, Russia, China, um, they're not our enemies. It is ultimately about connection. It is about working together. It is about development. And and stopping stopping local environmentalists from shutting down energy nuclear plants. plants. Yeah. Nuclear Absolutely. plants and even fossil fuel plants, because this is what they do now, is they, they're just shutting down all these plants. They're not letting any new plants get developed. If you want to on a local level get involved politically, um, check out what the environmentalists are doing locally because they're probably trying to prevent en new energy plants from being developed. Abs yes. And and nuclear plants from being shut down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think another thing to do is point out ways that we could develop the United States, you know, talk yep. about about wouldn't it be great if instead of all these wars, the government spent money on rebuilding our neighborhoods and communities and and point toward things in your neighborhood that they could actually rebuild, you know, point toward the crumbling infrastructure, point toward the, the lack of resources, show how a growth based economy, a government of action. Uh, what kind of a difference it would make in your community. I think that's the important thing to do and constantly be raising 100%. that issue, you know, 100%. And, and showing how the degrowth of America, the deindustrialization has hurt working people in your neighborhood. And um, there's plenty of local examples of that. I'm sure people can point to. I mean, you just walk around the United States. I'm walking around here uh, in New York City. I mean, the amount of homeless people that I see, the amount of desperately poor people here in New York City is 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 massive. I mean, the food banks here are constantly are constantly overrun with people. I mean, this is this is capitalism at a dead end. This is a, a huge crisis of overproduction. Uh, and and the only way that it can ultimately be resolved is to have a rationally planned economy, to have the means of production be operated to serve the people and not according to the chaos of the market. Well, and again, just to quickly say the difference between what you mean by overproduction and what a degrowther means by overproduction is also important. If you can get them on overproduction and direct them towards the Marxist definition of it, um, which is uh, not just producing too much and yeah, making yeah. yeah, it's it's that is that's that's what we need to be doing. Like there are again, there are key miss miss. Uh, I want to say mistruths or untruths or just lies. Uh, that are put out there that use these Marxist words and attempt to frame things in a manner that um, that ultimately directs people towards consuming less. And it's not yeah. about consuming. Like consumption doesn't like the whole plastic straw thing is a perfect example of all this. Plastic straws in the ocean take up, and I I shit you not, 0.025 percent of the plastic in the ocean. Americans using paper straws was a fucking joke in terms of 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 addressing the plastic in the ocean. And it instead, it's about uh, fishing nets. Forty percent of the plastic in the ocean is plastic fishing nets that were just left in the ocean. You could address that very simple regulation with um, with um, consequences for for doing that. Uh, that is, but they don't care about that because they ultimately are working in support of these companies which are owned by you know blackrock vanguard state street etc like yeah. that's ultimately who they're in support of and so they're not going to touch whatever those investments are doing like it's it's that simple it's not about consumption like what yeah. you choose as a consumer doesn't matter yeah, the plastic straws things was more of a psychological operation to like yes. give a, put a con put that paper straw in everyone's drink to tell them, see, you are the problem. Yeah. See, mm -hmm. you have yep. to start thinking about on you know reducing your consumption. About your choices, about your personal yeah. choices. I saw yep. somebody sort of react in the comments about oh gas. Oh my god, more fossil fuel. But uh, if you go out and you start challenging this stuff, you are going to be called a science denier. You're going to be called a climate denier. And this is the justification they're going to be using now. This is the new eugenic science. Mm -hmm. uh, and Peter's film is great uh, about going into the history of eugenics. So uh, this climate climate science, this like degrowth climate change crap is the new eugenic science so what you if somebody calls you a climate denier you say i deny eugenic climate or i i, I deny eugenic science 
uh, mm -hmm. because that's what it's all about. You're you're for pro prosperity, human prosperity, aren't you too? You know, you gotta you gotta come at it with like we gotta do this for humanity, because um, they're gonna call you a denier, and, and they are. It's a reference to like. Uh, the Holocaust denial and they're trying try, right. going to try to make you feel like a bigot <laughs> and you don't care about science. Oh, you know what? I care about science so much. I think we should build more nuclear energy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Science That's says nuclear. nuclear. That's right. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Well, it looks like the documentary is about to premiere. Do we want to wrap this up and tell yeah. people to just go? I, I've been dropping the link in the chat over and over and over again. It's appreciated, too. And I, uh, I'm excited for everybody to see it. This was culmination of years of work. I've done tons of work on this. Um, it is. It took me most of this year to edit, and I'm really excited for people to see it. Um, and I'm sure that it will cause a bunch of random people to make videos about how bad I am. Awesome. That, that's how you know you've done it right. Yeah. You've done well. Let's go. All right. <laughs>